uh, I would like to start with thanking uh, the organizer uh, bring us to this uh, very interesting uh, conference. And well, I'd like to thank my uh, students and my collaborator who contribute to uh, this work. So uh, the work has two components. I'm an experimentalist working on uh, ultra fast uh, pump pro study of quantum material. So the tool that we use is a home built uh, ultra fast electron microscope. With that, we, we basically trying to uh, visualize the order parameter evolution at the laser quench. And then we, on the other side, we have, so we, we took some time to develop the instrument and now it's working. And the other side, we have a team to uh, do the scientific exploration with quantum materials, All right? So what I want to talk about today, basically are covered by uh, this very long review article that we wrote that uh, will should be out very soon. And so if you like a more question, I'm happy to send a draft to you uh, afterwards. So uh, the motiv motivation, like many uh, ultrafast scientists, is to uh, try to uh, be able to uh, control the quantum phases, particularly uh, light-induced phase are very interesting. They have uh, very unusual properties. And at the foundation of it is really, we believe it's a non-equivalent physics problem. So, uh, however, uh, the issue was not very clearly uh, outlined because the ultra phase uh, technology usually looking at the microscopic degree of freedom, we have quasi particles, and many body physics look at long range order and long wavelengths, uh, long wave limits. So there is some little bit of mismatch here. So with scattering, we can uh, bridge that gap in terms of uh, the understanding. So we are in a way building on the foundation of existing ultra phase uh, spectroscopy studies. So I would, the, the talk will cover uh, basically four parts. The first one is I will introduce the methodology, how we uh, examine the problem, how we engage the interaction quench. The second is to uh, develop a theory to describe uh, non equilibrium scattering formally. Then. Currently, the scattering mostly are described for the equilibrium states. So the non equilibrium uh, process, the scattering uh, sort of a form factor is not very well described, particularly for the phonon and fluctuation. So we need to piece things together. And then this is actually encoded in the Landau Ginzburg equation where we describe the dynamics. And then we will uh, talk about the experimental observation of uh, the system which involve uh, non equivalent steady states and ethereum phase driven by laser. And if I have time for the first stimulating discussion, I'd like to also talk about universal dynamic far from equilibrium. Okay. So, uh, as uh, Matrano eluded this morning, that uh, there is a material science dream to be able to uh, cohere and control uh, the quantum phases, right? So, this is has been a, a very uh, uh, top, very uh, hot topic recently. And actually, in parallel to this, uh, in chemistry, people has been working on a photochemistry problem where they use a laser to uh, manipulate uh, the molecular states, right, by photo excitations. And the difference between the two is that in a molecular system, when you excite one electron, you change the energy landscape, right? Therefore, you can manipulate uh, the motion atoms. But for a quantum, a large quantum uh, material, you need to change more than uh, one electron, right? So it's like photo doping effect. You need to change a certain percentage of uh, electric excited process to a certain percentage electron and hole in the system to drive the evolution, right? So, so the, the, the idea is that what kind of a, excitation and mechanism we need to drive a, a phase transition in quantum materials. Okay. All right. So obviously we are all inspired uh, by the fascinating experiment done with a quantum gas microscope. It has been discussed by uh, ben, Benjamin and by Lev and Ern, Ernie, right? So um, so as Anna uh, alluded earlier, that it is very difficult to study uh, 
hard material because you need a very fast uh, high resolution, also spatial resolution. So, so we're trying to uh, reach that with, uh, with the te technical development. Okay, so let me start with describing the system uh, with a landau ginsberg equation. So this is familiar uh, Mexican hat potential, right, described here. And uh, so typically this equation is described in terms of temperature quench. So here the ground state is a low temperature state, right? And so if you change the temperature to below Tc, then you, you unfold the potential from uphill to a maximum head. And the bottom of the uh, energy minimum, you have this uh, mode, right? So here you have the phase mode and amplitude mode. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about materials, right, like a density wave, they actually have uh, two degree of freedom. So one is electronic degree of freedom, which define the density wave, right? So the microscopic charge condensate. The other is the phonon, right? The phonon coupled to the periodicity of condensate, and that lead to a lattice distortion. And that's what we can measure, right? Uh, with, with the scattering technique. And so when you describe a density wave, not only you have so the maximum head potential, you also have periodicity, which is encoded in a wave vector, which is derived from the phonon dispersion relationship, where when you, when you approach a critical temperature, the phonon then soften because of a very specific momentum uh, selective electron phonon coupling defined by the topology of Fermi surface. Right? And that gives you the spatial periodicity where we can probe with the scattering, okay? So that's what it is. So, you, you, so microscopic to talk about density wave, people talk about Fermi surface, uh, susceptibility where uh, at a particular wave vector, the susceptibility is very large and that trigger instability, hence uh, forming a density wave here, okay? So, <clears throat> so, with this system, we like to ask two questions, right? With a laser, right? Laser interact with, with the, dense, the condensate in the density wave. Can you introduce a new broken symmetry order? Typically, when people talk about laser, they talk about melting because when the, you apply laser pulse to material, you heat up the material, right? So when the heating usually lead to melting, not a formation of new order. And so-called photo-induced phase transition, people are interested in inducing a new uh, long-range order. So how does this happen? Right. The second is that when you uh, do a, a interaction quench with a laser, the system eventually thermalizes because laser has its own energy which will deposit to a system over a certain time. The system thermalizes. Okay, that has some consequence, right? So these are two different questions we need to address. So uh, to look at uh, these, we look at all the parameters. We do a, a scattering. So basically, we measure in the correlation function in momentum space, which you do a Fourier transform will translate to a, a correlation function in real space. And there we can build a structural model. And so we do a pump probe experiment. We use a laser to pump the system which is stored in the electron microscope. And then we send in a femtosecond electron pulse then to do scattering, right? So uh, the microscope is a, a multi-messenger uh, device which you can do imaging, you can do a scattering, you can do spectroscopy, right? So so ideally, it is uh, useful to look at complex problems like, uh, like phase transition, both on the short time scale and short length scale, also a long time, a large scale problems, okay? So just to give you an example. So here, because we're looking at mostly the phase transition and we look at the momentum space. So I'm showing here mostly the results on the scattering with a very coherent electron beam with the setup. So this is the typical diffraction patterns that we obtain from thin film uh, density wave materials, typically about 25 micron we put inside a microscope. It's about 10, 20 nanometer thickness. It's very homogeneous. We send a laser, be uh, send an electron beam through, and this is the pattern of density wave. So the bright spot here show the short range periodicity, right? Momentum space inverse of real space. So this is basically the lattice. The density wave described by the, the satellite around the very bright black spot, right? And so, and you actually see a multiple, right, satellite, which just tell you your density wave is not harmonic wave, it's actually 
an enharmonic system where it has, it has domain. So how you analyze the problem is you look at momentum space and you do Fourier transform, right? So since you are sampling both the atomic steel ordering and long range order by a density wave, so your Fourier transform will show the atomic scale distortion, in this case, so called a Davis star distortion wave of density wave. The size is about 1.5 nanometer. And then if you look at long range, you can see the periodic domain, right? This is a hexagonal domain or texture of density wave in the long range. Okay, so this can be uh, resolved uh, by scattering. And then we then uh, talk about when you quench a system with a laser, you see how the system evolved both microscopically and microscopically. Okay, yes. Okay. Um, I feel like I, I don't understand the experiment well enough, so I just want to understand it now. Okay. This is a static system, right? There's no this, this static, drive, yeah. There's no laser. A charge density wave in, right. in equilibrium. I don't understand what's being plotted here. You have an electron beam that's coming on the surface, and right. you're seeing how are you getting these these momentum peaks? Okay, so this is a diffraction. Mm -hmm. So so this is your real space patterns. It's mm -hmm. like great diffraction grating. So electron wave comes in, it's a coherent wave. They create interference pattern. So this is the diffraction pattern from this sort of atomic grating, which is encoded with a density wave modulation on, on the atomic grating, right? So basically just a, it's like a grating, right? And Okay, I guess I, I'm missing something, which is usually when you do an electron beam with right. microscopy, right. It's nothing like this. You're not measuring momentum space. You're measuring real space. You must be operating in an incredibly different limit. Right, right. So, it, yeah. so electron microscope, you can operate both in the imaging mode. So if you look at electron microscope, they typically look at the real space. But even the best uh, electron microscope, the resolution about 0 0.5, 0 0.3 angstrom. But here, the, the interatomic distance you need and the vibration is a result to 0 0.001 angstrom. The vibration is small, right? Compared to the distance. So usually you do diffraction that give you a higher, higher spatial resolution because of the Fourier transform. So your moment space is very large, right? So Fourier transform you can get a very fine scale. Okay. And then, sorry, the one last question. Okay. You mentioned this comes from the electron phonon coupling. Should I think of this as being the lattice distortion that you're seeing? Yes, yes. Okay, and it's not just the electronic charge density wave that's diffracting the electron. Right, right. So in this case, it's commensurate charge density wave. So that means the, you know, it's, it's more like polaron effect. But there are child in a way, which is stride phase, which is more of a, a typical sort of a Fermi surface driven instability. The electronic energy scale is, is a larger one, so therefore density wave distortion is really subjected to the change in the, in the electronic structure that you introduce by laser pulse. No, I, I'm still asking a dumber question, which is I just need to understand what's the matrix element that's scattering the electrons. Okay, the, the matrix element. The okay. All right, so so I got you. Okay, so what happened is that you consider this is like a, this like this every single dot here is atoms. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm here looking at the the density difference, right? Meaning that this is like a perturbation of atomic distort atomic position. So if this is if this is uh, the, White, it is no color, meaning there's no distortion. When it's bright, that means you're moving into that position. It's dark, meaning it's left behind, right? So each atom will scatter electron wave, right? Produce a spherical wave. And because different atoms is registered to different locations, so there's a phase shift between the scattering from neighboring atoms. And so then, you know, then you build up the whole different pattern in the long range, and that gives you these patterns. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. So, so now we have a way to identify the order state from disorder state, right? And then we talk about uh, the phase diagram. So we can we can have a phase transition from a, a disorder state like a metal into a density wave through a critical temperature, or you can do some sort of de doping or chemical uh, doping or doing some sort of a a laser excitation, right? So this is a typical phase diagram. And if you lower the temperature, you go from disorder to order states. That's a thermal phase transition. 
right? But on the other side, you can also do a chemical doping, apply pressure, or do a photodoping. Then you can also go from disorder to altered states. Nonetheless, the critical point could be a thermal one or could be a interaction-driven one. So if you are at zero temperature, people talk about quantum phase transition, right? But most material has all the phase in a finite temperature. And, a, and you can create a doping or apply pressure. You can drive a system from order to disorder, or from one order to another. Those, nonetheless, still interaction driven, but we don't talk about quantum transition, but it's nonetheless has an important physics, which is related to uh, how the order state are created, right, to begin with. Okay, and so you can, uh, so you can do a fast temperature quench to drive a system to order, or you can do an interaction quench, right? Okay, and so, so this already tells you a quantum material has two control parameters. One is the temperature, right? This is a real material. You can see you can drive phase transition with temperature change. You can also do a chemical doping. So, so you can, so both temperature interaction can drive phase transition, right? So this is intrinsically embedded in, in, a, in a sort of phase diagram, okay? And so we then we can write a landau ginzburg equation to describe the phase transition. Here you can see that you have a temperature turns, which gives the critical temperature of each, each states, and you can also have interaction turns. Okay, so that means that if you change the interaction turn, you don't need to change the temperature, you can drive the phase transition. I'll give you an example. If I reduce the interaction turn by suppressing the electronic order, so this, you can rewrite the equation absorbing this interaction turn into the bracket. So effectively speaking, you can change the, the effective critical temperature. So if you change the effective temperature in such a way it is equal to the ground state temperature you start with, then the phase transition happens without need to heat in the system, right? So that's one way to look at these two different uh, sort of a, uh, control parameters in driving the phase transition. Okay? All right, so this is an example, right? We take a uh, system like a checkable order, right? A, a checkable order, a, a square lattice, you have two different ways of breaking the symmetry. One is along, let's say, x, and one is along y. And so, intrinsically, the energy landscape should be uh, di bidirectional. And, but because of spontaneous symmetry breaking, when a system breaks symmetry and one phase dominates, because of repulsive coupling that we talked about earlier, then the other phase is suppressed thermodynamically. That's just come out of the equations that we have, right? But then if, you, so you have predominant order, then if you use laser, you can suppress the predominant order. Then effectively speaking, that you are promoting these competitive uh, partners. And this is just a calculation done for one of the experiment systems we studied. And you can show by using thermal by changing the temperature, you, the system evolves thermodynamically, just heats up and come back. But if you drive this with a laser, you can introduce a new energy landscape, which is bidirectional. So you can actually can create a checkable order from a stripe order by using a laser quench, at least theoretically. Just follow the thermodynamic line log Ginzburg equation. You don't need to change anything, just write down the thermodynamic line log Ginzburg equation, and then the theory will predict that you can create a checkable order, which is thermodynamically not allowed. Okay. And uh, so let me uh, go, just skip all the detail about theory, about the scattering formalism. I, I guess it's not important for the context, other than just saying that we we, are, we derive all this based on uh, uh, the sort of a coupling uh, distortion of the lattice. Okay, so we can skip all of this. Now I'm introducing the system I just mentioned. So this is a, a 2D density wave, a check, basically a square lattice, N and C are equal. The density wave is actually, uh, it actually resides within these telluride atoms, these metallic sheets. Within this metallic sheet, you, you have the, the charge density wave order, and this is very similar pattern I just reported earlier. You can see the square lattice, it's a very bright, bright uh, black peak, which is come from the atomic unicell. But then over there, you have this long range modulation of density wave, which is re registered by these satellite peaks, right? And so you can see that in the ground state, the satellite peak only move in one direction. That means you 
you have only one kind of a CDW is a dry phase, right? It's dry phase. And, uh, and you can look at that dry phase, phase transition is a typical second order phase transition, okay, with a, a critical temperature. And this happened also in, in study transport. So it's a, it's a typical uh, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, density wave system. Yes? So just looking at that plot, it looks like the order parameter is not zero above DC. Yeah, there's a little bit here, right? Yeah, should that alarm me? I mean, like. Yeah, it, typically in a low dimension, you have fluctuation, and we probably couldn't rule out the defects as well. So, so it, you know, might contribute to, to that. Okay. okay. The fluctuation will also contribute to a, a scattering away, right? Before, before the, the critical temperature of fluctuation. Okay, so. So this is a typical second order phase transition. It's a weak, weak coupling system. Okay, and so as I said that in a more strong coupling regime, which is when you use a lighter uh, rare earth components, electron foreign coupling is very strong. So when one phase becomes dominant, the other phase is excluded from being present in the thermodynamic phase diagram. When you weaken you know, electron foreign coupling by increasing uh, the the uh, rare earth components, then you, you become more degenerate. So you can see both phases. But now to say the system we study in the ground state, there's no, uh, the phase train, the, the predominant phase is, is along C axis, of course, CCTW. And A axis is, is excluded because of the, the, the mechanism I just talked about is a repulsive coupling between the two CTW system. Okay, All right. So, so this is experiment, right? So I already show you the, the ground state data where, and here is the ground state data, which is the CDW happen only along one direction, right? So now I apply a laser pulse. Okay, and then you can see the CDW along the other direction does pop up according to the very simple landau Ginzburg equation, thermodynamically formulated. The only thing I said I, I need to put into the equation is my laser pulse suppress the existing order parameter. And through the repulsive coupling turn, the theory will predict the formation of a new order in the, in the other directions. Right? So far, so good. The theory does work to some extent. Then we look at sort of uh, the fluctuation. So if you look at fluctuation, which is the sort of around, it's like diffuse getting around the black peak of a pre-existing order, you can see the, the suppression of existing order happen at zero of time. And the, the rise of fluctuation has a little bit delay. So is the rise of the new order, right? This is a delay, you see. Okay? And so the theory predicts, actually, similarly predicts that in order to form a new order based on the equation I, re, I just wrote, you need a minimum threshold above which you can drive the critical temperature from high temperature to below your initial temperature. And that's right here. So experiment data does show that there's a minimum threshold you require to form a new order. Yes, there's some sort of a little bit pre-transition of scattering weight. Okay, so we we associate probably the same reason why the ground state has it. Okay, nonetheless, the the threshold behavior is well identified. Okay, so that that is also check out. So this is how you derive based on the previous equation how the new effective temperature. So we call it non thermal critical temperature because it's actually reduced compared to the initial one, okay? So now I draw, according to experiment data, the energy landscape after interaction, the laser quench. So this is a new energy landscape. So let's follow the dynamics on the new energy landscape. So as I mentioned that when the, the laser arrives on the system, the other parameter gets suppressed, right? So system will evolve along the new energy landscape. So you can see immediately the initial order parameters along the C-axis is, is reduced to the, because they are, they are get driven into the new uh, minimum position. But this is a steep descent, so they cannot go for straight from here to there. This is a steep descent, so they will be driven by the potential new energy stuff. They will go down, down here first, then attracted towards the new minimum, right? So that's why there's a little bit delay because they, they couldn't go from straight from here to here, okay? And so if you look at the second process is the fluctuation, 
build up, right, also in the process. And so when you dissociate the existing order, the static mode, extending will dissociate into the moving mode, which is the phonon. And they are incoherent. They, they, they contribute to the fluctuation. So, so this is a diffuse scaling pickup, right? And that also happened after the first step, along with the build up the new order parameter. So you ask a question, how a new order parameter is, uh, is, is constructed from a disordered order parameter field? Well, you know, it's complicated, in fact. So we talk about cosining. The cosining in the field theory may be that usually that involve phonon, but in the CDW system, the fluctuation built on top of phonons, right? The fluctuation CDW is not, it's not a moving mode. It's actually the fluctuating standing wave. So you need to combine two moving phonons together, counter propagating to form a standing wave. And then which cosin, right? develops its correlation lens become a sharp, well-defined CDW. So there's actually additional process which is, needs to be considered for the coarsening of, of a density wave. Okay. So the third process is the extension of the correlation lens. So there's a delay for the fluctuation to, to, to kick in, and then the fluctuation will condense into a singular wave vector CDW. So you can see the correlation lens grow as the system evolves. Right? So this is something that's shown in the final scattering. Okay. And you also can look into uh, the phonon by looking at in other scattering uh, phone, other phone factors that you can derive. So I'm not going to into detail. I'm saying this all come out by looking at the uh, dynamical scattering phone factor by including both the CDW uh, state fluctuation, also the phonon. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too much about this. But if you look at very long time, we find that the system really never fully relaxed. So there is this change of the wave vector, which is indicative of a topological defect in the system, which distorts the field of CDW, which is long-lived after the long range or the spontaneous brain order. So this is predicted by Kibo and Lurie, right? So this is something naturally come out, and it's actually within our time resolution up to three nanoseconds, it has not decayed. Okay, so this is also kind of interesting. To know, and similar phenomena has, has actually have been reported by spectroscopy uh, using uh, some sort of special arrangement. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gear to talk about two second type of system. This involves this complex universal phase diagram. Okay, so this is a system for a transition metal dichalcogenide. This is exactly this system. So you have phase transition driven by temperature, phase transition driven by the pressure of, of, of by doping, right? And so, and actually I show the differential data for this. This is what I showed earlier, right, with our different patterns. So this is a hexagonal structure with, you know, this domain structures. Micro microscopically, you have this triangular atomic unit cell, right? And so, Macmillan actually has developed a Landau Ginsberg equation in 1976. This worked very well, five minutes lab, thank you. And so in addition to this spontaneous image breaking free energy density that we have discussed earlier, you have additional term, which due to this kind of a, a long range periodicity of system, which create the domain structure and also create uh, different CDW states. So if you uh, sort of uh, uh, looking at this system and ask a question that, you know, if you would drive a system with a laser, what would happen? And so this is this famous paper, which actually showed that you can create a hidden states by a shining laser, and which created this, uh, this new uh, insulator uh, metal phase transition, which is, is not discovered in the thermal dynamics. You can actually switch on and off. So this is something uh, quite famous among the ultra phase community, right? So. Now, can we actually use our methodology to describe the phase transition, the same methodology you have to use for the, uh, the previous system? Okay, so I'm going to skip that too. We have five minutes. So I'm going to just go into this energy landscape picture. So we wrote a free energy landscape based on modification of the landau ginsberg developed by Macmillan with experimental uh, observable, which allowed to constrain the landscape, okay? 
And so basically, based on that, we can see energy landscape has multiple minima. So if when you shine a laser, you can drive a system evolution. First, they will suppress amplitude like we've seen in the previous system. Then they rotate into a new minimum, and then suppress and rotate, right? It's the same kind of process we see earlier. Okay, and that's seen in the experiment. You suppress all the parameter, and then rotate, and rotate, and then suppress and rotate. Suppress. This is a sort of a transition path. Okay? All right, so the... So now let's focus on the final situation, final states to simplify a problem. Let's, let's talk about from the, the final, this uh, sort of a so-called uh, near commensurate state, which is the state right before they go into this generic charge energy wave, it's called incommensurate. So how, what happened there if you shine a laser pulse? So use the landau ginzburg equation, we can construct the free energy. So if you uh, use the free energy we construct based on data, you can see that if you heat up a system to about 350 degree, right, thermodynamically, then the system drive will go from the, the so-called near commensurate to the incommensurate. This is actually described by the phase diagram here. Okay, 350, right, so this is consistent with that. And uh, the in interaction driven turn actually come out by matching the data here. But anyway, so you also can draw the free energy based on the laser quench, and you can see that laser can drive the suppression of order parameter from one to a small number where the system will evolve into a new state without any heating, right? This is no heating, just the quench at the same temperature. Okay? So now if we put the two energy landscape together in two dimensions, so that's what happened, right? System has two different Effective parameter. Why is the magnitude of order parameter, which is the strength of the distortion of density wave, the other is the rotation of the system. Okay? So if we design the experiment such that your quench itself is not sufficient to go across uh, the critical temperature where you don't need the thermal energy to drive the batteries, you are just below. So they will be driven into these so-called trap states, your local minimum. So they will be very stable. But since your laser has energy associated with it, so eventually the system will thermalize, right? So you can see, this because we, we know the temperature and laser are co-control uh, parameters. When the system thermalize, they also move the free energy. Okay? So now you can look at trap state, which they, they trap in a, in a, in a trap state of some configuration closer initial state for some period of time. A system summarizes, then they evolve into a new state, right? So these are quench and summarization problems. And so by looking at which time the new state form, we can look at the short time limits, the red and long time limits. And you find two different thresholds. As we understand, if you wait a long time, the thermal dynamic energy will dominate. So you will see a threshold very close to the thermal threshold. If you wait a very long time, it's a thermal very transition. If you look at short time, Right? And then you will have phase transition with certain amount of thermal energy if you will have quenched system to a higher level. And, but in any case, so in both cases, if you look at short time, both for the first and second critical threshold, the curve looks like more like continuous in the first order. The long time limit is the first order, right? So that kind of implies that in the short time intermediate time scale, there is some sort of a critical Dynamics possibility, even though in a system which is strongly first order, right? Right. So, uh, so then we look at the data, right? So this is uh, the data. So you have a two different threshold. If you if you quench very little, the system wait a very long time to thermalize to a higher temperature, and then they eventually leave the trapped state and move into new states, right? If you quench very very far, then the system doesn't need to thermalize very far and they will move into new states. And so you live with this very long-lived uh, plateau, which is the system yet fully summarized. And that seems to be some sort of scaling behavior, right? And then if you look at over a very long time, that's over this very long time, right? The system then evolved into a new state. You can see how the, the system evolved into state is also depending on the level of quench, okay? All right, so now if we do some sort of a rescaling, and you can sort of a collapse both in horizontal and vertical scale. 
respect to two different thresholds, and and they follow some sort of a, a universal behavior. Before the this is before the system summarizes, right? So there's some sort of universality in the in the trap state or pre thermal states, right? So now we can also look at what happened in a long time when the new state forms. It's a new broken symmetry state, right? We can look at how the state form. So you can see, if you look at the structure uh, scattering function, you can see that the scattering width is going from broad to narrow, right? And so that's the typical situation where the system calls them because when your momentum uh, spread is small, that means the range of order is larger, right? Okay, and so this is the, the if you look at it, the structural factor momentum distribution function for the scattering, you can see that the scattering wave moving towards the infrared as time evolves. Okay, so this is very similar to this sort of a discussion about the non thermal fixed point, even though these are cosine dynamics. And so you can look at the, the scaling exponents, which is uh, typical, and then you can do a collapse again by looking at uh, the length, both looking at the correlation lengths versus all the parameter strengths. And you can collapse all this dynamic into one curve independent of where you are in the first or second threshold. So it's independent microscopic detail here. Even though by the speed of uh, a cosine, you can derive a rigidity, which is very different in two different regions. Right. So I think also yesterday's discussion also talked about rigidity. So when you quench very deeply, the system become more rigid. Right. But nonetheless, the universality still hold. Okay, with that, I think I will stop. Okay, and uh, I this is what we have done, and I cannot be done without these people. I thank you for your attention. So I have a sort of tangential question, which right. is, uh, uh, do I understand right that all those experiments were on 2D materials? Yes. And if so is that a restriction of your method that you're using to measure things, or can you do 3D materials as well? Yes, yes. So uh, it's 2D material simply because the density wave exists in the, in the thin two-dimensional sheet. But the thickness of material is, is uh, up to 40 nanometer in our case, but you can go up to 100 nanometer. So, it's, so you can study three dimensions system as long as they are thin enough, the electron can penetrate. Okay. Right, that's all. Okay. So if you, you also can tilt the crystal to look at the interlayer uh, periodicity and coupling. Maybe can you go back to, it was, you're showing theory results with these two phase transitions at different times, maybe, yeah, the slide before this, I think. Yeah, so uh, uh -huh. nope, the one after this. Okay. I think this went by a little bit quick for me. So there are these two phase transitions, and it seems like so looking at the at the right. Uh huh. Um, and so at very short times and at very long times, the second one just doesn't appear at all. Is that right? Right. So what happens is that if the phase transition happened already in a short time, in a long time, you won't see it's already in a new phase. Right, so so it, so there are two different thresholds. If your laser intensity is strong enough above the second critical point, mm -hmm. the phase phase transition already happened, right, in tens of one hundred picosecond time scale. So if you observe what system is, how it transform into in at one nanosecond, they are already in a new phase, right? They are already in a new phase. So. So that's why, but, but if you are doing the intermediate scale, uh, for scale, you can see some sort of a competition between the two. So you said dip here instead of a, yeah. Any last questions? All right, if not, let's thank Chang Yu again. Thank you. And all the speakers. So.